Yeah, welcome to Seismic Radio, uh, and our website is www.seismicradio.org, and today we're going to look at uh, the seven churches, and we're looking at the second church, which is uh, Smyrna. It's uh, less than a glorious uh, revelation about this church, but uh, we'll, we'll see. First of all, let us see where Smyrna is. We are, we're looking at the second church, and please try and follow the mouse on um, the computer. If you're listening via the radio station, um, uh, Ephesus was the previous church we were looking at, which is the first church in the seven churches of the book of Revelation. Smyrna is the second church. And uh, both churches, and you can see this on the map here, uh, they are in Turkey, as are all the other se uh, seven churches as well. And uh, the church is located right at the coast. Yeah? Uh, just to uh, get the context together, uh, Minor Asia was uh, pretty much a Hellenistic area, so it's been conquered by Alexander the Great. A lot of Greeks settled into this area. And uh, Smyrna was also a Hellenistic a Greek city at the time of Christ. There was a huge flourishing community, Jewish uh, community, and uh, also uh, quite a strong Christian community. Okay, um, right, we've got another map here, and you can see a little bit more uh, where Smyrna is located. So we've got Patmos here, and this is where John was, who had the vision. Then we've got Ephesus, and then we've got Smyrna. Uh, again, uh, you can see it's a nice uh, harbor area where Smyrna is located, um, and, and obviously the harbor and the transport would... Uh, create quite a bit of prosperity for the town as well. Uh, the second church, but the story is a little bit, um, a little bit sad, really, but uh, really great on the other side. Uh, I've got this old map here, which we looked at in the last uh, church, which was the Church of Ephesus, and it looks, when you look right here, that this map is actually quite old. It, it was put together in 1917, I think, uh, judging by Laodicea when. Uh, the church age uh, was sort of described. Now, um, first of all, we've got uh, the name, which is Myrna. That's what it tells here. Then it's in uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 2, uh, verses 8 to 11. That's where we find the address. Uh, and it's not really an awful lot written about um, the in the letter to the church in Smyrna. It's just a very short letter and a very comforting letter as well as such. And um, as I said before, Smyrna was a real church. So the um, address to Smyrna was meant for a real church with real people within a real time, sort of towards the end of the first century. And, um, um, but it also stands, and, and this is one interpretation of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, it stands for a church period and a type of church which exists and also a period in church history. And uh, these guys here, you know, put this map together. They decided, right, this bit of church history must be from the year 100 to 313, uh, which is basically a period where Christianity was quite uh, significant in the Roman Empire. The Romans got a bit worried about it, and they started persecuting Christians. And um, uh, it, it depends which history book you read. Uh, I counted nine um, periods of persecution, uh, Arno Gebelein uh, identified 10 persecutions. I mean, there's a significance to that as well. We're going to look at this in a, in a minute. Now, the character of the church is about martyrdom and tribulation. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. Um, Christ's title, Christ calls himself who was dead and is alive. And, and obviously, uh, when you look at martyrdom, it's all about, it's a very sad thing. It's, you know, people come to Christ, they get persecuted, and uh, they get martyred, you know, they... Uh, live some time and then times go a little bit mad and suddenly they have to uh, suffer tribulation and they get murdered for uh, being Christians. Um, when I look at it today, it's, it's obviously you see it all over the place. Uh, I'm going to talk a, about a little bit more about tribulation and about persecution in a minute. Uh, there are good points as well. Uh, bear in mind, all the letters to the churches are really report cards, uh, but all we have here is just good points and it's about endurance and tribulation, you know, they endured tribulation. That's a good point. Faults, it seems to overcast all the faults. None, none of the faults are mentioned here. And the reward to overcomers is the first resurrection. Yeah. Obviously, it's all about, you know, you're giving your life for Christ, literally, physically. And that's pretty much the ultimate price. A lot of people uh, in those days recanted, but many didn't. And they overcame and they faced death rather than putting a little bit of incense on a little altar 
in honor of Caesar. It would be a, a two-minute act, but it was the difference between death and life. Okay, uh, that's Smyrna, really, and that's in this nice little summary here. Um, okay, let's have a look at some of the pictures of Smyrna. Uh, Smyrna is a city in Turkey today, and it's called Izmir. Yeah, you can see this down, uh, follow the mouse. You can see this down here, so you, you see the support city, and uh, like with many modern cities, uh, who have got a long history to look back upon. Uh, you see old and new next to one another. You've got the old um, harbor in antiquity, which was there, and it's uh, indicated on one of the images here. And then obviously the city has grown into the hinterland and uh, is still there. Uh, there are a lot of pictures here as well, so uh, pretty much like uh, many places in in Greece and in Turkey, you see uh, old Roman uh, yeah, bits of architecture standing around. Uh, the big problem is the region has been riddled by earthquakes and very often temple buildings and other buildings have collapsed and uh, all that's left are just a few columns or, or, you know, partial structures which are a little bit more stable. The other problem as well is over time, you know, when people didn't really treasure uh, the antiquity in their backyard, people would uh, take stones and masonry and use it for their own homes. You can see a uh, little presumably old temple sites as well. In Smyrna, um, there's a little um, panorama of Smyrna, just a very little one, if you look on, on the uh, picture here. And and one thing you can see as well, there's old and modern uh, literally next to one another. I would not be surprised if many, many buildings are built on top of old structures, which, you know, were there a long time ago. When you look on Wikipedia and you look at the history, it uh, goes well back before Christ. Uh, so we're looking at about four or five hundred years BC, um, then obviously still there today. And I assume there's been something there all the time since it is quite a, um, you know, an interesting harbor, interesting port city. Okay, that's Smyrna. That's what Smyrna looks like today. Izmir, Turkey. If you ever go on a holiday and you just happen, um, especially in Europe, I know a lot of uh, Europeans go to Turkey on holiday. If you happen to be in Turkey and you happen to be near Izmir, why not just go there and spend a, spend a day, maybe just going to, to Smyrna and uh, also think about um, you know the letter in Revelation and what Christians have been going through throughout uh, the ages. Uh, okay. Notable Christians of Smyrna. Um, uh, again, we've got Irenaeus. He was there in Smyrna. Uh, we've got Polycarp, who was the bishop of Smyrna. He was uh, instituted by the apostles. And then we've got Ignatius of Antioch, who uh, wasn't a resident of Smyrna, but he uh, obviously traveled through and uh, quite a few letters um, uh, still around, which, which talk about you know what was happening in Smyrna. Uh, in the late 2nd century, Irenaeus also noted, Polycarp also was not only instructed by the Apostles and conversed with many who had seen Christ, but was also, by Apostles in Asia, appointed Bishop of the Church in Smyrna. Always taught the things which he had learned from the Apostles and which the Church has handed down, and which alone are true. To these things all the Asiatic Churches testify, as to also those men who have succeeded Polycarp. So Polycarp was an outstanding bishop, and uh, right at the end of this talk, we're going to read um, a report of the last moments in Polycarp's life, where he was martyred. Um, so anyway, Smyrna is uh, well known. Um, there are a lot of documents relating to Smyrna, and um, um, and we know quite a bit about it you know, through through church history and uh, through what was happening in uh in in Smyrna, especially you know in the in the second century and and later. Right now to the letter itself. We find it in uh, Revelation, the second chapter, and it starts at verse eight. And I'm going to read it out. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write: These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and pro poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be heard. Okay, uh, I'm going to quickly paraphrase it and go through this uh, short um, letter. Okay, so um starts off to the angel of uh, the church in Smyrna, right? Yeah. These things says the first and the last, that is Jesus Christ, who was dead and came to life. That's the title Jesus is giving himself, who was dead and came to life. So don't fear death. Jesus came back to life. Uh, Jesus is all about life. That's really the message which is in, enshrined in this name. I know your works, tribulation and poverty. And uh, again, it's very important when you when you look at this. These guys in Smyrna, they were working for the kingdom of God. They were working for Jesus Christ. They did suffer tribulation. They were opposed in their work and in their efforts in promoting the kingdom of God. And it, it sounds that they were poor. And they may just be out, outwardly poor, but inside they were really rich. Um, and then we've got the other side. yeah. And, and Jesus says, he knows the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. Yeah? But bear in mind, at the time when this was written, um, um, there was a big thing. Christianity was seen as a Jewish sect. It wasn't really separate uh, from Judaism, but it was considered to be part of Judaism, uh, but somewhat different. So um, what, what, what is really said here is that, uh, you know, there's some guys there around and they, they claim to be Jews. They claim to be, you know, from God, but they are not really. That's what it comes down to. But they are of the synagogue of Satan. They are, they are on the contrary. They are from the other side. They are not really from God, but they are from Satan. And he carries on and he says, Do not fear uh, any of those things which you are about to suffer. Uh, and and this, is, this is a prophecy, and it's not a very good prophecy either. Um, um, the, uh, Jesus says here that um, something is going to happen in the future, but you are not to fear it. And it's a bit like uh, if I tell you and I go, you know, do not fear what will happen to you tomorrow. You, you start worrying a little bit. Yeah, especially if you're if you're not quite sure of what it is all about, and and there's a, an element of uncertainty, you'll be very nervous about if I if I if I tell you, yeah, don't worry, don't fear about tomorrow. Yeah, it'll be okay. Don't worry about it. It's it's maybe the point when you start worrying what will happen tomorrow, whether I know something you don't know, and um, you know what to do about it. But anyway, we are talking about Jesus. Jesus talking. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He knows the uh, the end from the beginning. So he knows what is going to happen tomorrow. And and all he says, don't fear, you know, it's okay, don't worry about it. And he says, indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. So that's not a very prosperous, uh, very interesting thing, very prosperous thing to, to say that. Um, you know, some people end up into prison. And, and you have to bear in mind, prisons in um, uh, pretty much in, in all ages, other than in our day and age, they were really horrible places to be. So you you would be in a dark. Um, very often, I've seen a, a dungeon in in one of the castles here near uh, near my hometown in Paderborn, and um, they they got a, a prison in there, and um, and that's where if somebody misbehaved, that's where they put him to. You could still see the shackles. Uh, at the moment, it looks a bit more domesticated. Uh, all the walls are whitewashed, um, but I I remember going in there. When the walls weren't whitewashed and they were just like uh, you know dump old stone walls with a tiny amount of daylight coming into it and then just a tiny slit for fresh air to get into it and then these guys were shackled up in in a horrible place um, i would have thought if i'd been in there for two or three days it uh, it would drive me insane I, I i'm not sure how you know these guys in the past would would suffer being in prison for such a long time sometimes uh, so when when it said here that the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, um, uh, don't think about uh, a nice little room, you know, heated, centrally heated with uh, a nice little window, possibly even air conditioning uh, with a TV set, a little desk where you can sit down and do your stuff. And the only difference is um, you can't go where you want to go, but you still get your three meals a day. You still get your wash in the morning. You can lie down, you can do, you know, entertain yourself with books and, and other things. Uh, it's not like that. <clears throat> but it's, it's, it's harsher. It's, it's just barely surviving. That's really what it comes down to. And it says here that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Now, the ultimate test is if you get thrown into prison for your faith 
and a little statement from you will release you instantly like I recant or I'm not a Christian or I don't want to have anything to do with Jesus um, that is a real test and uh, and he says here you will have tribulation 10 days yeah, 10 days could be 10 periods um, could be uh, um, not sure. I mean, literally for Smyrna, I'm not sure whether historically there's uh, an event within Smyrna that there was 10 days of madness where Christians were put to death um, to the physical church where this was written to. Um, Arnus C. Gabelein says that there were 10 persecutions in the Roman Empire uh, from uh, 100 AD to about 300 and I think 20 AD until Constantine stopped all this stuff and he said, right, you know, Christianity is now uh, um, allowed, permitted. <clears throat> but um, uh, again, there, there are 10, about 10, I counted nine, there are 10 persecutions. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I mean, it didn't stop there. Even though we look at the Roman Empire, we look at the world in its uh, heyday, uh, which was pretty much the, the known world, obviously we had the Persian Empire and other empires at, at the at the back. Um, the thing you have to bear in mind when you look at persecutions and 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 the the whole thing there's there's been a history of persecution which goes right into our century. Um, and I just want to sort of highlight you the the Roman Empire stopped at about uh, four five hundred and they had about maybe two hundred years of peace as far as Christian persecution was concerned. Um, but then something else took place. You started getting, um, you know, 600 AD, Muhammad came on the scene and he started persecuting Christians, you know, vehemently. And, and again, that was part of the old Roman Empire. So you had North Africa, you had the Arabic Peninsula, you had the Middle East. Um, it was all part of the Roman Empire and um, it was a cradle of Christianity, uh, was really in North Africa. Uh, and then people always think, oh, Rome, you know, old Christian traditions, and it's been around for a long time. It wasn't really the case. The, um, in the first centuries, uh, a lot of the church fathers, they all came from North Africa. So there was a lot of interesting stuff going on, um, you know, around about Alexandria, Egypt, uh, Libya, all these places around there. Anyway, they got all run over by Islam. Uh, very often it was a choice between death or conversion. Um, Christians, faithful Christians were slaughtered, uh, others converted, and uh, when you look at some of the North African states, Christianity is de facto non-existence. It's, it's very, very small. You're looking into less than 1% of the population uh, following Christ or being at least Christian by name or nominal Christians. Uh, Egypt a little bit different. It's about 20%. Um, then when you go to the rest of the Middle East, the beginning of the century was about 20%. Uh, at the moment, we're looking about 5% and less. But anyway, uh, one thing is certain, Christian persecution took place. Very often people groups who did not convert to Islam uh, suffered persecution all the way through. And uh, let me quickly run you through the centuries afterwards. Um, we had obviously the Islamic onslaught and Christian persecution. Um, the Crusades, even though they've got a very bad report, um, anyway, they they were uh, partly inspired due to reports coming back that Christians were getting enslaved by uh, by Muslims. So Christians went on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. They did get enslaved, and uh, lots of horrible reports were coming back. And uh, it was felt from the um, from the church at the time that action was needed, and people were uh, were encouraged to go to fight in the Crusades. So we got that. Uh, what else did happen? So we had Christian persecution. We had um, um, the Inquisition, which, uh, uh, e even though it was meant to, to, you know, look at people who, are, who were in cahoots, cahoots with the devil, to sift them out and uh, try to rectify them. And if they didn't want rectification, they would just uh, uh, murder them. Uh, but inevit inevitably, uh, it, it was also used as a tool against Christians who were believing the Bible, which was at odds with what the Pope was saying at the time. So the Inquisition was a great tool for the Church to get all dissidents dealt with, uh, and very often through death. Um, there are reports that southern France was 
a lot of cities in southern France were Bible-believing Christians, the Albigenses and, and others. And again, many of them um, uh, were slaughtered. Uh, cities were besieged. Uh, they were conquered and Christians, sometimes indiscriminately, uh, even Catholics at the time were slaughtered as well, uh, only because they were living in the same city as where um, the Albigenses were, were living and which the campaign was aimed against. So uh, people would cut um, believers down indiscriminately. Um, when you look through church history, you had um, just a, a whole lot of um, groups throughout the, the medieval times. So I'm, I'm looking at about from 800 onwards, uh, right up to the 1500s, to the, to the time of the Reformation, where persecution was quite uh, heavily imposed upon Christians. So it never really stopped. So even after the uh, fourth century, um, when, when at least the Roman Empire decided that's enough, we are no longer persecuting Christians, um, persecution still carried on in, in other ways. So it went from the Roman Empire, uh, after it broke down, to, to the Islamic onslaught, uh, with huge amount of Christian persecution, and it's, it's I mean, only God knows what the, the real figure is, but we are looking potentially at millions who who died for the name of Christ over uh, the years within the uh, Islamic world. And then um, we've got the, um, um, from the 1500s to, to the last 500 years, and again, one might think persecution was, wasn't really taking place, um, we always had where people started dissenting, where people embraced a different uh, creed than the one which was predominant, that, that these guys were inevitably persecuted. I, I had a look at the history of the Hutterites, who started about 1500s, and they were pretty much shifted from one country to another on account of persecution, where they had to go from one country to another to, um, uh, to be able to worship their God in the way they felt was right. Um, we're looking at maybe the last um, hundred years, 1900s, and you think, oh, this is an enlightened age, you know, we've got secularism, you can believe what you want, and so on. Um, and yet, we have got, uh, within the communist East, for near enough 70 years, we had Christian persecution taking place. Um, it is, there are figures floating about that Stalin murdered about 50 million people uh, in his reign. Uh, he was just a, a man of blood. And it's assumed or it's suggested that about half of them whom he uh, arrested in his purges and they ended up in the gulags and were uh, either uh, shot as dissidents or um, were worked to death, um, that half of them were Christians. Uh, so uh, quite serious. Um, it's only in the 90s that within Russia persecution stopped and it seems that it's slowly creeping in again. If you are in Russia, and you're not an Orthodox Christian, um, you're in trouble, and you're likely to get persecuted as well. So there's still something going on in in Russia, and and it's um, I think it's a problem yeah, uh, today as well. We look at China, where persecution is real. The, the the Chinese government they see that a lot of people are becoming Christians, and they are nervous about it, and uh, and obviously they they try to curb it. So they they do all sorts of stuff. They they're not necessarily imprisoning them, shooting them which they used to do in the past, uh, but uh, they're trying to make life difficult for them. Uh, you have, of course, still persecution carrying on in, in uh, countries with Sharia law, implementation of Sharia law. So very often uh, the, the laws are just used to uh, get hold of somebody else's property. In Pakistan, they've got the blasphemy law. Somebody's accused of blasphemy, they end up in prison. It is not on a great scale, so you don't have like uh, hundreds or thousands uh, being executed, but uh, there are individuals, and reports are coming through from individuals who are who are getting slaughtered uh, in or getting dragged into court. Um, you know, all, all somebody needs to say, you know, they uh, maligned the name of the prophet, and and that's enough. Yeah, that's enough. And because they are Christians, you know, they are uh, considered to be guilty anyway because they don't really have the necessary respect for their prophet. So it was a big big problem. Um, we've got Indonesia, where persecution takes place. We've got North Korea. And uh, believe it or not, even America, persecution comes in again. So if you stand up for Christian values, uh, which discounts homosexuality as not right, yeah, 
and you voice your opinion or you've got the other thing as well you uh, uh, use Jesus' claim which is exclusive so there's no way to God except through Jesus Christ uh, which implies that um, any other way including Islam and other ways are wrong your voices and um, you get in trouble uh, there was one guy uh, in England who was uh, arrested for preaching um, and he was arrested because he compared Jesus to Muhammad and um, it was considered to be incitement of hatred so they arrested him uh, they didn't have enough evidence to uh, get the Crown prosecution to get on his case so later he was released but it's a very disturbing news how life is changing in in the West in the liberal tolerant and free speech West where where it disappears in America stories are coming through where people who are refusing to provide service to um, homosexual weddings uh, based on their faith are um, dragged into court and um, are made to pay pay out a lot of money and their stories of people losing their businesses and so on it may not be persecution to the point of uh, death and life but it's, it certainly is persecution, which may end up in prison and may end up in fines as well, or does end up in fines and in punishments. So we've got a real problem here. The persecution is, is just a reality today as it is maybe um, 100 years ago, you know, 200 years ago, 2,000 years ago, or near enough 2,000 years ago. So it's, it's a reality. We are dealing with persecution. Why? The world hates us uh, because we are not of the world. That's what Jesus told us, and, and it's just... Um, a part of Christianity. So if you don't suffer persecution, uh, check your Christian life. If you do suffer persecution, uh, take take some joy in it because it suggests that you're doing something right. And it suggests that it's something which Jesus has, has prophesied. Okay, what does Jesus say? So first of all, persecution is there. You know, there's the synagogue of the Jews, but they are not. There's the synagogue of the Satan. There are a lot of people who claim to be people of God, but they are not. They are people of Satan. And that that is what Jesus is saying. Yeah. So, uh, again, don't be surprised if the religious community turns on you uh, for, one, for one reason or another. You know, sometimes even within the church, you, you get very strange people, um, you know, doing strange things and uh, giving you a hard time. Uh, I would say today we are dealing with two types of Christianity, um, and not just today. I think it's for the last 1,500 years, possibly for the last 1,600 years. Um, we've got a... A nominal Christianity, you know, they are just Christians or people of convenience. They see Christianity as religion. And then we've got real Christianity where people are dedicated to Jesus Christ, where they've given their lives to Jesus Christ and they've surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. They're born-again Christians. Um, their code and their guide is the Bible and, and nothing else. And very often we find that, that these people are um, uh, not liked by the nominal Christians because they've got something they haven't got which is a real relationship with Jesus Christ they sense it and they find this very disturbing and so you do get and you do suffer persecution from inside of the church sometimes yeah, where Christians are giving a hard time to other Christians for one reason or another um, ok uh, what does Jesus say to us be faithful until death and he will give us the crown of life Yeah, we've got this uh, cataclysm, you know, be faithful to death, you get the crown of life. Um, and, and the good thing here is um, there are only two churches amongst the seven churches who in their report card have got nothing negative, nothing but reported. And these guys here, there's no nothing but reported. It's just say, look, there's some terrible stuff that's going to happen to you. Hang on. Just hang on. You know, overcome, persevere, and you will get the crown of life. Um, and it says further, he overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Yeah, that, that's a promise as well. So the second death has got no power upon you. You will not be hurt by, by, by it. Uh, so it's a, it's a lot of comfort. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Smyrna, the factoids, the name means bitterness. Um, again, if you go to the first one, I'm not quite sure where they get this from. It means anointing oil. Um, it, again, it probably depends on where it comes from. Now, this factoid comes from uh, Arno C. Gabelein. At, um, um, he's, he's a great Bible expositor um, at seismicradio.org you can go to our resources page and you can download his commentary to the Bible which uh, is in a PDF file um, it's very interesting very interesting to read and it tidies up a lot of you know strange ideas people have come up with with certain Bible passages 
Um, Gabeline suggests that there were 10 persecutions in the first four centuries. Uh, I challenge you to check it out. I, I counted nine, but uh, maybe the tenth one is just the, the ongoing persecution which never stopped after the fourth century. Um, another sort of factoid is there was a strong Jewish community in Smyrna, hence, you know, the talk about the synagogue of uh, Satan, bearing in mind that um, the Jews claiming to be the people of God, the Christians being um, uh, a sect, a side group of the Jews in the first century, um, they they would not accept Jesus Christ. Now, the Jewish community would not accept Jesus Christ and, and very often were opposing quite vehemently um, the Christian community. If you go into Acts, you, you see all sorts of things that um, they try to use uh, to incite persecution against Christians and try to... Uh, reduce the, the impact of them. We've got Polycarp who got martyred. Polycarp is one of the church fathers. He was instituted by the apostles. Um, he served in Smyrna for a long time. He is renowned to have died or s supposed to have died in 155. And he must have been very old. He said that he served Christ 86 years. Uh, I'm not sure when he became a Christian. Uh, or whether that was his age, but it suggests that he was very old. He might have been, uh, you know, well advanced in his 80s or possibly even in his 90s. Um, there is a reference book, which again you can also download for seismic, from seismicradio.org. So if you're interested in uh, the Smyrna experience or the Smyrna phenomenon, uh, have a look at Fox's book of Martyrs. And Fox was a... a a Christian who wrote this book in the 16th century, I think. And you get like a, a fairly good idea of all sorts of martyrs from the very early days and stories which have been survived from the very early days, from the, the first persecutions in the Roman Empire right up to uh, the 1500s. Um, it's it's very interesting to read, uh, but, but I, I would encourage you to spend some time go through this book. Um, <clears throat> now, Promise of Persecution. Um, when you go to, let me see if I got it on here, I don't think it's on this computer, it's another computer. Uh, when you do a search on persecute or persecution, uh, you get loads of references in the New Testament. I've just taken two out. And, uh, and Jesus talks that persecution is a reality. You will face persecution. So obviously, if you believe the Benny Hens and Joel Osteens and who else have you got? Um, Paul Crouch, uh, he's dead now, Kenneth Copeland. You know, it's just all about faith and name it, claim it, and you will be prosperous. And it's all about you making a lot of money and being very rich and enjoying the richness or the abundance of God. And um, when you look at the Bible and you measure what these guys are saying against what the Bible is, it's not quite, not quite like it. Um, and I just took out two scriptures here, and uh, I'll leave it at that. But um, the point is, Jesus said, you're going to be persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and when you, this is in Matthew 5, it's in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, when you look at these scriptures in context, you see a lot more, you know, a lot more talk by Jesus about the persecution. He said, if we are persecuted for his name, uh, name's sake, uh, we, are, we are blessed, Yeah. And uh, we'll get a reward. So if you suffer persecution, first of all, don't be surprised. And secondly, uh, count yourself lucky. Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to go back to, um, to Revelation chapter 2. When you look at what is said in Revelation chapter 2, there's no bad report card. Yeah? There's only good things. Every church other than uh, Smyrna and Philadelphia, uh, they have got a, um, a, a a good report card and a bad report card. So good good points and bad points. And there are only two churches where, where Jesus don't mention, doesn't mention any bad points. And um, and obviously these guys they are paying the ultimate sacrifice. They are paying with their lives for their faith. So count yourself lucky if you if you fall into this category, and you overcome and you hold hold up to it. No but report card, but all you all you get is just a reward. One thing again I, I, I want to encourage you is we need to get away from uh, focusing on our earthly existence. Yeah. We are on the earth, we are in a body, yeah, we, we need to feed it, 
we need to make some money to survive. Um, God knows all our needs. He he knows what's there. We should be reasonable and make sure we we can get through this life without, uh, you know, suffering too much and without causing too much of a havoc. You know, work, pay your bills, do your stuff, but but don't get focused on it. Don't get hooked on it. Don't get hooked on becoming rich or getting lots of money or, or, or doing some stuff. And this is what these prosperity teachers want to try to get you hooked on. So you forget about God and you go away from God. Um, anyway, um, the promise we have is persecution. And if we have persecution, uh, there's a great reward once we die. And this is one thing you have to, to bear in mind. Once you leave here, I mean, dying is not really uh, such an issue for us as Christians. Jesus says that whosoever believes in him has crossed over from death to life. We will not see death, but we have crossed over from death to life. And um, and then that is a very important thing that that our in our first of all our home, our identity, our heritage is not here on earth, but it's with Christ. And uh, and we need to to bear this in mind. So uh, try and if you can focus your um, your mind on on what Jesus has got in store for you on the hereafter and not here on earth. Don't build homes here, you know, nice, uh, comfy homes, which you have to leave anyway, but focus on the on your eternity. Um, it's just something I want to, to, to put towards you. Uh, I think especially in our day and age, um, this focus has often been lost, especially in the Western world. A lot of people just focus on the here and now, you know, the type of car, the type of flight, the type of holiday, you know, what flights... Are they doing? Where, where are they going to? What destinations? You know, the career very important, and, um, and and then you've got all these crazy prosperity teachers who who confirm you in this, and they claim to be from God, but you look at the Bible and you see something totally different. Okay, um, the next verse is, and that's just the ultimate promise of persecution. It's in in uh, the Gospel according to John. And remember the word that I said to you. This is what Jesus is speaking. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Yeah. Persecution. You know, they persecuted Jesus, they will persecute you as well. And um, one thing I, I want to suggest to you, it doesn't matter who you are, you will suffer for your faith. People, for no reason whatsoever, will hate you because you are a Christian. And they will disadvantage you because you are a Christian. Um, I haven't suffered, you know, persecution to the, you know, at the type, you know, what the Smyrnans had to go through. Nothing like it, but um, I've come across this, that everything was fine, everything was right. You know, you find favor with some people uh, at work or in other places, but other people, they completely hate you for no reason whatsoever. Uh, Paul says in Corinthians that um, some of us, for some of us, we, we are the aroma of life. They They sense that there's something special about you. Um, as you as you walk with Christ and as you are, uh, you know, a dedicated Christian, and others they smell the stench the stench of death, um, and they know when they come near you that their doom is pending upon them, and they don't want to you know yield to God in any way whatsoever. But they know that you represent their judgment, and that's the reason why they hate you, and they want to get rid of you. Um, in my life, a little bit, I, I've suffered this persecution to no great deal, to no great extent anyway. Uh, I'm, I could not put myself into the category of Smyrnans, but I've noticed and I've experienced that people at work and elsewhere were very much opposed to me and were uh, bent on making my life difficult or on destroying me, destroying my career or whatever. So uh, prosperity guys tell you, oh yeah, everything is going to be fine, you know, um, just do this, send me your money, you know, do your seed thing and everything will be good. You know, you will have uh, prosperity and career and everything will be better. Uh, the reality is if you are a Christian and you are living out your Christian life and there's Jesus and people can see uh, Christ inside of you yeah, through the transformation Jesus is doing in your life, they can see that there's something more, that there's something heavenly, something supernatural inside of you. Um, uh, they will hate you and they will give you a hard time and sometimes they will do the opposite. They will stop you advancing and progressing in your career. But nevertheless, all, one thing you always have to bear in mind, God is in control here on earth as well as, as he is in heaven. And ultimately, um, you know, doors will open, doors will get shut and, and that, that is down to God. And if God opens the door, nobody can shut it, even the persecutors. They can't shut it either. Okay, the story of Polycarp. Um... 
and I'm gonna gonna read it to you. Uh, right, let's go there. Polycarp again was um, a minister, a bishop in Smyrna, and um, I'm gonna read um, the uh, story of Polycarp to you. Um, the Church of God, which Sir John's at Smyrna, to the Church of God, which Sir John's at Phil Philomelium, and to all the brotherhoods of the Holy Universal Church, sojourning in every place, mercy and peace and love from God the Father and our, our Lord Jesus Christ be multiplied. We write unto you, brethren, an account of what befell those that suffered martyrdom, especially the blessed Polycarp, Polycarp who, st who stayed the persecution, having as it were set his seal upon it, upon it by his martyrdom. For nearly all the foregoing events came to pass that the Lord might show us once more an example of martyrdom which is comfortable, conformable to the gospel. For he lingered that uh, he might be delivered up, even as the Lord did, to the end uh, that we too might be imitators of him, not looking only to that which concerns ourselves, but also to that which concerns our neighbors, for it is the office of true and steadfast love, not only to desire that oneself be saved, but uh, all the brethren also. Blessed, therefore, and noble are all the martyrdoms which have taken place according to the will of God, for it behoves us to be very scrupulous and to assign to God the power over all things. For who could fail to admire their nobility and patient endurance and loyalty to the Master, seeing that when they were so torn by lashes that even as far as the veins and arteries and inward mechanisms of the flesh were visible, they endured patiently, so that the very bystanders had pity and wept, while they themselves reached such a pitch of bravery that none of them uttered a cry or a groan, thus showing to us all that at that hour the martyrs of Christ, being tortures, were absent from the flesh, or rather that the Lord was standing by and conversing with them. And giving heed unto the grace of Christ, they despised the tortures of this world, purchasing the, at the cost of one hour a release from eternal punishment. And they found the fire of their inhuman torturers cold, for they set before their eyes the escape from the eternal fire, which is never quenched, while with the eyes of their heart they gazed upon the good things which are reserved for those that endure patiently, things which neither ear has heard nor ear has seen, uh, nor I has seen, neither have they entered into the heart of man, but were shown by the Lord to them, for they were no longer men but angels already. And in like manner also those that were condemned to the wild beasts endured fearful punishments, being made to lie on sharp shells and buffeted with other forms of manifold tortures, that the devil might, if possible, by the persistence of the punishment, bring them to a denial, for he tried many wiles against them. But thanks to God, for it truly prevailed against all. For the right noble Germanicus encouraged their uh, timorousness through the constancy which was in him. And he fought with the wild beasts as a signal way, in a signal way. For when the proconsul wished to prevail upon him and bade, bade him have pity on his youth, he used violence and dragged the wild beasts towards him, desiring the more speedily to obtain a release from their unrighteous and lawless life. So after all this, so after this, all the multitude marveling at the bravery of the God beloved and God fearing people of the Christians uh, raised a cry, "Away with the atheists! Let let a search be made for Polycarp." But one man, Quintus by name, uh, Phrygian, newly arrived from Phrygia, uh, when he saw the wild beasts turned coward, he it was who had forced himself and some others to come forward of their own free will and recant their faith. The proconsul, much by entreaty, persuaded this man to swear the oath and to offer incense. For this cause, therefore, brethren, we praise not those who volunteered to recant, since the gospel does not so teach us. Now the glorious Polycarp, at first, when he heard it, so far from being dismayed, wanted to remain in town. But the greater part persuaded him to withdraw, so he withdrew to a farm not 
far distant from the city. And there he stayed with a few companions, doing nothing else night and day but praying for all men, for the churches throughout the world, for this was his constant habit. And while praying, he fell into a trance three days before his arrest, and he saw his pillow burning with fire. He turned and said that to those that were with him, It must needs that I shall be burned alive. Since uh, those that were in search of him persisted, he departed to another farm. Immediately they who were in search of him came up, and not finding him, they seized two slave lads, one of whom, whom confessed under torture. For it was impossible for him to lie concealed, seeing that the very persons who betrayed him were people of his own household. And the captain of the police, who chanced to have uh, the very name being called Herod, was eager to bring him into the stadium, that he might fulfill his appointed lot, being made a partaker with Christ, while they, his betrayers, underwent the punishment of Judas himself. So taking the lot with them, on the Friday about supper hour, the police and horsemen went forth with their accustomed weapons, hurrying as against a robber. And so coming upon, coming up in a troop late in the evening, they found the man himself, Polycarp, in bed in an upper chamber in a certain cottage. And though he might have departed from there, here to another place he would not, saying, The will of God be done. So when he heard that they were come, he went down and conversed with them, the bystanders marvelling at his age and his constancy, and wondering why, they should be, why there should be so much eagerness for the apprehension of an old man like him. At that he immediately gave orders that a table should be spread for them to eat and drink at that hour, as much as they desired, and he persuaded them to grant him an hour or so he might pray unmolested. And there consenting, he stood up and prayed, being so full of grace of God, that for two hours he, he could not hold his peace, and those that heard were amazed, and many repented that they had come against such a, a venerable old man. But when at length he brought his prayer to an end, after remembering all who at any time had come in his way, small and great, high and low, and all the universal church throughout the world, the hour of, of departure being come, they seated him on a donkey and brought him into the city, it being the high Sabbath. And he was met by Herod, the captain of the police, and his father Nicetus, who also removed him to their carriage and tried to prevail upon him, seating themselves by his side and saying, Why, what harm is there? And saying, See there is Lord, and offering incense with more to this effect, and saving yourself. But at first, But he at first gave them no answer. Whenever they persisted, he said, I am not going to do what you counsel me. Then they, failing to persuade him, uttered threatening words and made him dismount with speed, so that he bruised his chin. Uh, as he got down from the carriage, and without even turning round, he went on his way promptly and with speed, as if nothing had happened to him being taken to the stadium, and there being such a tumult in the stadium that no man's voice could be uh, so much as heard. But as Polycarp entered into the stadium, a voice came to him from heaven, Be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. And no one saw the speaker, but those of our people who were present heard, him, heard the voice. And at length, when he was brought up, there was a great tumult, for they had heard Polycarp had been apprehended. <clears throat> when he was brought before him, the proconsul asked whether he were the man. And on his confessing that he was, he tried to persuade him to a denial, saying, have respect for your age, and other things in accordance therewith, as, uh, is, as it is a habit to say. Swear by the genius of Caesar, and repent, and say, Away with the atheists! And Polycar with solemn countenance looked upon the whole multitude of lawless heathen that were in the stadium, and he waved his hand to them, and groaning, and looked up to heaven, and said, Away with the atheists! But when the magistrates pressed him hard, and said, Swear the oath, and I will release you. Revile Christ. Polycarp said, Eighty-six years I have been his servant, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? But on his persisting again and again, and saying, Swear by the genius of Caesar, he answered, If you suppose vainly that I will swear by the genius of Caesar, as you say, and feign that you are ignorant who I am, hear you plainly, I am a Christian. But if you would learn the doctrine of Christianity, assign a day and give me a hearing. 
The proconsul said, Prevail upon the people. But Polycarp said, As for yourself, I should have held you worthy of discourse, for we have been taught to render, as is proper, to princes and authorities appointed by God, such honour as does us no harm. But as for these, I do not hold them worthy, that I should defend myself before them. Whereupon the pro proconsul said, I have wild beasts here, and I will throw you to them, except you repent. But he said, Call for them, for the repentance from better to worse is a change not permitted to us. But it is a noble thing to change from, from which is improper to righteousness. Then he said to him again, If you despise a wild beast, I will cause you to be consumed by fire, unless you repent. But Polycarp said, You threaten that fire which burns for a season, and after a little while is quenched. For you are ignorant of the fire of the future judgment of and eternal punishment which is reserved for the ungodly. But why do you delay? Come, do what you will. Uh, saying these things, and more besides, he was inspired with courage and joy, as, and his countenance was filled with grace, so that not only did he, did it not drop in dismay at the things which were said to him, uh, but on the contrary the proconsul was astounded and sent his own herald to proclaim three times in the midst of the stadium, Polycarp has confessed himself to be a Christian. Uh, when this was proclaimed by the herald, the whole multitude, both of Gentiles and of Jews who dwelt in Smyrna, cried out with ungovernable wrath and with a loud shout, This is a teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians, the puller down of our gods, who teaches multitudes, not a sacrifice, nor worship. Saying these things, they shouted aloud and asked the uh, Asiarch Philip, to let the lion loose upon Polycarp. But he said that it, that was not lawful for him, since he had uh, brought the sports to a close. Then they uh, thought fit to shout out with one accord that Polycarp should be burned alive. For it must needs be that the matter of the vision should be fulfilled, which was shown to him concerning his pillow. When he saw it on fire while praying and turning round, he said prophetically to the faithful who were with him, uh, I must needs to be burned alive. These things then happened with so great speed, quicker than words could tell. The crowds immediately collected timber and sticks from the workshops and bath, and uh, the Jews more especially assisted in this with zeal, as is their custom. When the pile was made ready, divesting himself of all his upper garments and losing his belt, he endeavoured also to take off his shoes. Uh, though not in the habit of doing this before, because all the faithful at all times vied eagerly, who should uh, soonest touch his flesh. Uh, for he had been treated with all honour for his holy life, even before his grey hairs came. Immediately then the instruments that were prepared for the pile were placed about him, as they were going likewise to nail him to the stake. He said, Leave me as I am. He has granted me to endure the fire, will grant me also to remain uh, on, at the pyre unmoved, even without security, which you seek from the nails. So they did not nail him, but tied him. He then placed his hands behind him, and being bound to the stake, uh, like a noble rum out of a great flock for an offering of burnt sacrifice made ready and acceptable to God, looking up to heaven, said, O oh, Lord Almighty! Father of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have received knowledge of you, the God of angels, powers, and of all creation, and of the whole race of the righteous, who live in your presence, I bless you because you have granted me this day and hour that I might receive a portion of martyrs in the cup of your Christ, unto resurrection of eternal life, both of soul and body, and the incorruptibility of the Holy Spirit. May I be received among these in your presence this day as a rich and acceptable sacrifice, as you did prepare and reveal it beforehand, and have accomplished it. You that art faithful, the faithful and true God. For this cause, yea, and for all things, I praise you, I bless you, I glorify you, through the eternal and heavenly High Priest Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, through whom with him and the Holy Spirit be glory both now for ever and for the ages to come. Amen. When he had offered up the Amen and finished his prayer, the fireman lighted the fire, and a mighty flame flushing forth, a we to whom it was given to see, saw a marvel, yea, 
and were preserved that we might uh, relate that we might relate to the rest what happened. The fire making the the appearance of a vault, like a sail of a vessel filled the, filled by the wind, made a wall around the body of the martyr, and it was there in the midst. Not look like flesh burning, but like a loaf in the oven, like a gold and silver refined in the furnace. For we perceive such a fragrant smell, as if it were a wafted odor, of frankincense or some other precious spice. So at length the lawless man, seeing that his body could not be consumed by fire, ordered the executioner to go up to him, to stab him with a dagger. And when he had done this, there came forth a dove, a quantity of blood, so that it extinguished the fire, and that all the multitude marvelled that there should be so great a difference between the unbelievers and the elect. And the number of these latter was this man, the glorious martyr Polycarp, who was found an apostolic and prophetic teacher in our own time, a bishop of the Holy Church, which is in Smyrna. For every word which he uttered from his mouth was accomplished, and will be accomplished. But the jealous and envious evil one, the adversary of the family of the righteous, having seen the greatness of his martyrdom and his blameless life from the beginning, and how he was crowned with the crown of immortality, and had won a reward which none could gainsay, managed that not even his poor body should be taken taken away by us. Although many desire to do this, um, and to touch his holy flesh. So he put forward uh, Nicetus, the father of Herod, the brother of Alci, to plead with the magistrates not to give up his body, lest, so it was said, they should abandon the crucified one and begin to worship this man. So this being done at the instigation and urgent treat entreaty of the Jews, who also watched when they were about to take it from the fire, not knowing that it will be impossible for us either to forsake at any time the Christ who suffered for the salvation of the whole world of those that are saved, suffered through uh, faultless, for, suffered though faultless through, for sinners, uh, nor to worship any other. For him being the Son of God, we adore, but the martyrs as disciples and imitators of the Lord we cherish as they deserve for their matchless affection towards their own king and teacher. May it be our Lord also to be found partakers and fellow disciples with them. The centurion, the centurion therefore, seeing the opposition raised on the part of the Jews, set him in the midst and uh, burnt him after their custom. So we afterwards took up his bones, which are more valuable than precious stones and finer than refined gold, and laid them in a suitable place. Um, where the Lord will permit us to gather ourselves together as we are able in gladness and joy to celebrate the anniversary of his martyrdom for the commemoration of those that have already fought in the contest and for the training and preparation of those that shall do so hereafter. So it befell the blessed Polycarp, who having with those from Philadelphia suffered martyrdom in Smyrna, twelve in all, is especially remembered more than the others by all men, so that he is talked of even by the heathen in every place, for he showed himself not only a notable teacher but also a distinguished martyr, was martyrdom all desire to imitate, seeing that it was after the pattern of the gospel of Christ. Okay, I'm going to leave it at this with uh, Polycarp. That's the story of Polycarp. Um, very inspiring, I think, and uh, yeah, quite. Uh, quite a, an interesting story of, of what was going on in 155 AD in Smyrna, in Mana Asia. Okay, uh, let's go to the next one. That's a conclusion. The conclusion about Smyrna is Christian persecution is real. Dying for Christ is the ultimate price you can pay. And again, the reality is there today. It's been there in the last century. It's happening in this century. Uh, some people say there's more persecution happening today than um, it has been for a very long time. Um, maybe any other period in, in, in the history of mankind. Uh, so we've got China, we've got North Korea. There's still some persecution taking place in, in, in Russia. It seems that it's coming back to the West as well through uh, secular legislation. Maybe not quite as severe as, um, as it is in in some of the other places. Uh, we've got persecution um, in Indonesia, in um, 
some of the Indo Indo China, uh, the countries within Indo China, uh, Vietnam is quite serious. Uh, so so you, you hear reports from all over the world of, of persecution taking place, and I don't think that there has been a period in history which was beyond which was out of uh, without persecution. Uh, the lesson in Smyrna tells us there are riches in, in tribulation, and the riches are obviously not seen here. You may lose everything you have, including your life, um, but you will get recompensed in the life to come in the hereafter, in your eternity. So if you are persecuted, count yourself lucky, almost, because even though you may lose everything you've got here, uh, your family, your life, your friends, your property, your lifestyle, your convenience, uh, being comfortable. Um, but nevertheless, um, the, the promise we've got here is that you, you are comforted. Jesus is comforting his persecuted church in this letter. And you will, even though you may not be comfortable, you, you will receive comfort. And there's a great reward in the life to come. Now the burden placed on them, that's interesting as well. So there's no, you know, repent of this or repent of that. But just persevere, you know, hang in there. That that's all there is. So I'm not quite sure, you know, how to say this. I I obviously I don't like suffering like anybody else. I'm a normal human. I don't like pain. I don't like hardship. Again, I'm I'm just a box standard normal human. But um I would suggest to you that maybe we should pray for persecution. Because number one, it cleans up the church. All the fake Christians will soon be something else. I believe the church. And you would have a church which will only be filled with real Christians, uh, predominantly. And you will find that uh, you know everything will be a lot better. Your prayer life will be better. You know, encouragement will be better. You'll have uh, real fellowship with real Christians. Um, and also, as I said before, we have to live and we often forget as Christians with an eternal perspective in our in our minds. Uh, the day you came to Christ and the day Jesus Christ, you know, knocked on your heart and you let him in and you became a Christian is the day your eternity started. Uh, the problem is very often in our frog-like mentality, we uh, have got a very low horizon and we don't dare to think beyond the horizon. Yet the Bible is very clear and has told us, you know, what is happening beyond the horizon. And beyond the horizon is our eternity we start. Uh, we don't fully understand what the other side of the horizon looks like what our destiny looks like. We we just get a glimpse of it. But uh, we should invest in our eternity more than in our life here on earth. That's for sure. Um, perfect report card. Yeah, That's the other thing as well. Look at the other churches and there are so many issues. You know, All these issues somehow seem to evaporate with the persecuted church. So what's the conclusion? If you're not in the persecuted church, I, I would encourage you yeah, to pray for your brothers and sisters and the persecuted church. At the moment, we've got it going on in Syria. Christians are getting beheaded, sometimes nominal Christians. And I believe that, you know, if you confess for Christ, even though you may just be a nominal Christian, you've never really made a decision, but then finally there comes a point, you know, recant, become a Muslim, or, you know, die for, you know, what you've been born into, for Jesus Christ. It is a decision which is strong, and I believe that many people may be, you know, who've never really had a relationship with Jesus Christ, but suddenly at this point, they will start being serious about their relationship with Jesus Christ, and they be, they are beginning a relationship, maybe even minutes, hours, seconds before the blade hits their neck. Uh, I don't know, but I'm, I'm looking forward, you know, going into eternity and meeting those guys who had suffered this horrendous death, who were beheaded for the name of Christ. Um, I, I would encourage you to pray for these guys. Pray for these guys that they will find the strength to pull it through, that they will not grow weak, but that they will persevere. And um, also be grateful that you don't have to faith, face this horrendous uh, choice here on earth as yet, but it might soon be changed even in the West. The other thing as well is, I mean, don't be surprised if persecution takes place. And I'm, persecution is not just, you know, uh, you're going to be put in prison, you're going to be, uh, you know, put to death or something, persecution starts where you're rejected, disadvantaged, you know, foul-mouthed because of Jesus Christ, where people ridicule you because you're a Christian. That's where persecution starts. 
uh, first of all, don't be surprised if it starts, if it goes that way. And, and secondly, take joy in it. Yeah, maybe your reward is not quite as great as somebody who has to, you know, stand in front of the choice of, uh, you know, embracing Islam or having his head chopped off. Um, but there will, be, there will be a reward. You, know? you may lose here on earth. You may lose recognition, esteem, friends, uh, status, um, money, career, prospects. I don't know. You may lose here on earth. But whatever you lose here, you'll get many times over in, in the life to come. So take joy in your persecution, in your tribulation, in the moments where the world goes against you, where hell is let loose to just uh, turn you down. And um, and again, persecution happens on a spiritual realm as well, where sometimes people go against you and there's no reason whatsoever. Uh, I've recently experienced something where I suffered accusations um, which would potentially land me in prison if they were validated. There's no ground to this accusation, nothing whatsoever, but uh, accusations were made. And I had people shouting and screaming at me, uh, accusing me of, of having done a heinous crime. Uh, again, just a spiritual thing, you know, A and B went together, um, people went ballistic. Uh, I believe that um, that sometimes those people may easily be controlled by demons, might be a demonic thing, where they try to find a weak spot, where they try to strike a weak spot to destroy your reputation, destroy your, maybe even your life, your career, maybe even, you know, make sure that you end up in prison under uh, a false accusation. Um, happened to me recently as well. Uh, don't be surprised of it, about it. It is very depressing. It's very hard. You go through this and you, you ask yourself why, you know, you tried your best. You always made sure that, um, you know, you live a righteous life as much as possible and then suddenly you end up with... Uh, it's just complete madness around you, complete and utter madness. But but it does happen. It does happen. So if it happens to you, take courage in it. There's Myrna. Uh, the good the good the good thing is that um, Jesus knows about it. He knows about it. God knows about it. He will look after you. He will protect you. Uh, you may find yourself in a situation where you may end up in prison. You may end up in um, you know on death row or being beheaded likely to be beheaded for no reason whatsoever not even blatantly because you're a Christian but it's just because people turn around you they don't like you they sense that there's something inside of you and they they want to get rid of you they want to destroy you because you don't fit into their little world you don't fit into into their uh, godless lifestyle into their loyalty to um, the synagogue of Satan again uh, when you I read this report from Polycarp. I'm, I'm not quite sure good you could follow it. Um, if you go back to to what the text is saying here, saying here um, I'm going to go back to Revelation chapter 2, and it says, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to it, Okay. Um, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and they are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. You go to the report of Polycarp, and, and obviously the uh, the report against the Jews in Smyrna is not very well. It is said that they were inciting the crowd, that they were the first of getting the fire bundled for Polycarp. Even after he was dead, they tried to um, get hold of the corpse, make sure that it's totally destroyed, and, and so on. So they started meddling with the whole thing, and it seems to be um, a liter literal fulfillment of what is written here in Revelation chapter 2. That and, and we have got a completely different document written by different people. Obviously, they would have most likely known about Revelation at the time in 155 when uh, Polycarp died, when he was executed. Um, but but that's sometimes uh, the thing as well. You will get issues with relig religious people who will um, try and get hold of you, try and give you a hard time, and uh, you know try and challenge you in your faith. Okay, um, I'm going to close on the, on the one point, and I'm saying stay faithful to Jesus Christ regardless of what comes regardless of what you're likely to face. Don't believe the prosperity guys who tell you, you know, if you claim and you do a positive confession, everything will be fine and uh, you will be rich and you'll be lovely and you'll have everything, you know, which will just go the right way. It doesn't work like that. The Bible doesn't support this view. The Bible supports, on the contrary, a different view, and that is you are likely to suffer persecution and because of your faith in Christ, you may be disadvantaged in, in, in you know, where you are placed in society. Instead of you becoming, you know, the rich, wonderful, super-duper kind of guy, 
uh, it may be the other way around. You know, you may miss out on all the opportunities and you may just become a poor beggar ending up in prison for no reason whatsoever, ending up being persecuted for no reason whatsoever other than you being a servant of the Most High God, other than that of you being a disciple of Jesus Christ and Jesus being your Lord and Savior. Um, he suffered persecution, you will suffer persecution too. There's no ifs and buts. He says, if I, you too. Yeah, as simple as that. I'm going to close on this, this point and where I'll say that if you look at all the apostles, I hope I get my um, uh, facts right here. Um, from 12 apostles, obviously Judas uh, killed himself, um, but then we may as well take Paul and instead of Judas, you know, and from these guys, from, you know, Paul, the other 12 apostles, all we know is that other than John, all of them were murdered, killed, died as martyrs. Um, I always thought there were two, but I can't think of the other one who wasn't martyred, but uh, I think all of them were martyred. Yeah. So we've got James, Peter, Thomas, Thomas in India, he was martyred there. Paul was uh, martyred, yeah. all of them. Yeah. So... That's, that's what uh, the Church Fathers report. Uh, maybe should look back into this. Again, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking it's 10. Um, so that will be 10, all of them except two. But um, uh, uh, now, as far as I know, it's all of them except one. It's John who died a natural, a natural death. And there might have been another one. I'm not sure. But anyway, I'm going to try and find it out and maybe correct, correct me on this. But the point is the majority, the vast majority of the apostles, yeah. um, near enough 90% of them, yeah. Um, near enough, maybe 85 or whatever, but we are just talking semantics here. They were martyred. And what Jesus told to them was, was literally true. The only exception being John, and, and he wasn't in, in a good way either. He was on Patmos, it was a prison island. Um, so he wasn't free to roam out either, but uh, he just had a miserable life in Patmos. Horrendous prospects, yeah. So, prosperity guys, what do you say to that? I wonder. How do you get around this? How do you get around what the Bible says? Um, it may really annoy me, and you can probably hear this if you have listened to any of my other talks. Um, I find that, that these are pretty much the scum of modern Christianity. Um, some of the teachers may be genuine Christians, and they're just led away or led astray by this doctrine. Some of them who are proposing this doctrine and pushing it very hard, uh, I don't believe are Christians. Uh, I don't know. God will be the judge when, when the time comes. But all they are are just a bunch of shysters who fleece a flock for their own merits, turn a bunch, tell a bunch of lies, and one day, you know, when persecution comes around the corner, people wonder what's happening. Why am I suffering this? Why is there, you know, this befalling upon me? Uh, didn't my teachers tell me a completely different thing? No, the Bible tells you a completely different thing. And if it happens to you and you hit on hard times, um, just now it's it's okay. It's okay. God knows about it. You know, The devil has probably asked for it and he has been given permission to do it. Um, just know about it. Persevere. And in the end, you will overcome in Christ Jesus and there will be a reward for you as well. I'm going to close on this. God bless and bye-bye from... Michael here at Seismic Radio. If you want to check us out, www.seismicradio.org. I was talking about um, Polycarp, the Fox's Book of Martyrs, and um, the commentary to the New Testament by Arno C. Gebelein. Um, all of them you can download at um, seismicradio.org. Just go to the resources page and uh, have a look around. There's lots of stuff on there you can download. God bless and bye-bye from Michael here at Seismic Radio.